Good afternoon, one and all present here. I would like to welcome you all to the second edition of Orange City Literature Fest organized by Asia Knowledge Foundation. I am Purva Auja, anchor for this session and topic of this session is Is politics really about serving the nation? So on this amazing topic, it's my privilege to introduce our honorable speaker, Tohin Sena, Sanjay Jha, and Kenshuk Nagsa. Speaker Tohin Sena, sir, is a best-selling author and politician. Tohin Sena is acknowledged among the most prolific Indian writer with a maverick knack to experiment with new genres. He has authored 10 books now. His last book, When the Chef Fell in Love, with an interesting tagline, Kashmiriyat at Insaniyat Jamhuri. Hindustani at was in news recently as the solution outlined in the book for the Kashmir problem was and can be similar to the one initiated by the government with the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A and reorganization of the state. He has been a national media panelist and a spokesperson of BJP. As an articulate speaker, he brings a lot of objectivity to high decibel TV debates with his structure, nuance, or argument. Sanjay Jha is the executive director of the world famous Dalkanic Operations in India. Jha is also the former national spokesperson of the Indian National Congress and former president of All India. Sir has also been a TEDx speaker and has addressed enlightened audience at Brookings, Microsoft, ICI, ICI, Access Bank, IBM, the Dune School, etc. Sir founded one of the world's leading internet portals called CricketNext.com, which is now part of the TV18 Media Group owned by Reliance Industry. Kinshuk Nag sir is an author and journalist who served the Times of India for 24 years in senior position in New Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, Ahmedabad, and Hyderabad. A post-graduation in economics from the Delhi School of Economics, he is the author of many books, including the biographies of Narendra Modi, Atal Bihari Bajpayee, Mohan Bhagwat and Nikaji Subhash Chandra books. His latest book, A New Silk Road, India, China and a Geopolitics of a New World Order will hit the book stand soon. He is also the recipient of the Prem Bhatia Memorial Prize for coverage of Gujarat events. Abir Kapoor sir will be the moderator of this session. Abhi Kapoor is a journalist, board game designer, and author. He is the creator of India's first election based board game called The Poll, which has been featured in CNN, Vice, The Diplomat, and the several other national and international publications. He is the author of the most nourishing jailbreakers, Rupa 2020, which has just been cured by T-Series for Digital Rights. His articles has appeared in Hard News, The Wire, Scroll, Quartz, and others. He is currently building a new suit of games, a digital citizenship, and writing a graphic novel. Handing this session to you, Abir, sir. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, and it's, it's definitely an honor to be um, moderating such a fine panel um, and um, I think more than what I think we should just re get right into it. So I've had uh, the privilege of chatting with uh, all of you before and I've sort of thought uh, so I think what we would do is we would I would pose the question for the next five minutes I would give five minutes uh, to every one of you to just quickly set uh, and respond to the topic. And then I have a few themes that have ar arised 
through our conversation, which I will bring up and then we can move the conversation thematically. So in no particular order, um, I think to start off with King Shook, uh, who's uh, seen so much of the world, um, do you think that politics, uh, does politics really serve the nation? That's a very strange question. Does politics does serve the nation? Politics is part of our life. There have to be governments and to elect government there has to be political parties and for that there will be politics. So politics is there in our life. Now the question really to, that should be asked is, is politics conducted in the right way? There cannot be any idealistic answer for that. Politics is conducted in the way your system gives you. The system is that you will elect 543 Lok Sabha MPs and they will elect a government. But there are certain problems which I must point out. You have got 543 seats in parliament and that number of seats was fixed in 1971. So from 1971 you are electing 543 parliamentarians. However, in this period the population of the country has greatly increased from 1971 to now 2019. So each constituency has many more voters than they would have long time ago. For instance, I grew up in New Delhi constituency and at that time, when I was very young, say just, just about 15, 16 years old, there were 1 lakh voters in New, New Delhi constituency. But today if you see, there's got 20 lakh voters. Now to reach 20 lakh voters requires a lot more money than 1 lakh voters. It means that only people with resources and money can enter politics because if you don't have money and you can be idealistic how will you stand in an election and win so that's the major problem i think that's a major flaw <coughs> and this the ceiling of 520 545 seats will come become over in 1900 and uh, 2031 i think or 2026 and the next election will be 2031 Formally, the, when the number of seats was frozen at 545 in 1971, it was about 30 years. So it was in 2001. However, nobody raised the question, but I did. And I, as an idealistic young man, I took this subject, convinced the Secretary General of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, who is also now a politician, he's the Finance Minister of West Bengal, Abhit Mitra. So he, on my bidding, agreed to do a conference on this subject and we had a conference on this subject and we got all the top guns including the then speaker of Lok Sabha P.A. Sangma and to represent the Congress we had Pranam Mukherjee, to represent the BJP we had Jaswan Singh and all these people and all of them basically said we'll extend the freeze and I remember Pranam Mukherjee used to know me and he said Are, what sort of fool is this Nag he of course called me Dr. Nag and said, oh, if we have, we can always extend this to another 30 years. And that is exactly what happened. So we are holding election and we are saying it's a great democracy. But the fact of the matter is that you change, you have a system, it doesn't work. It works only for certain people. And let me tell you, if you see the parliamentary debates of around 60s, 1967, 70, the guys who are interested in changing the system then <coughs> so and you'll find a lot of interventions by Lal Krishna Advani and Atul Vyari Vajpayee then. But today they will not be interested because they are into power. So it's a system. So now if you can beat the system and come into power, why should you be interested in changing the system? <laughs> so I am not blaming either the Congress nor the BGP. The fact of the matter is that you have, this is a system which allows professional politics, politicians <coughs> to become politicians. And the real suckers are the people of the country like me and you. I hope you are also in my category. And, uh, so this is what I, this is my preliminary saying. You don't talk of democracy. We are the greatest democracy. So long as you don't change the system. So this is my preliminary statement. Uh, I think very, very well put, uh, uh, Mr. Nag. Um, I'm just summarizing, I think, that you are pointing to a crisis of representation. Um, and this is a point that I will touch upon later because uh, what we have found is that when 15 lakh people do end up voting you, you either think you're God or a messiah. Um, and we come up to uh, Tuhin. Uh, can we get your preliminary thoughts on the on the topic? 
Well, before I start, let me just compliment Kinshuk Ji. I recently read his biography on uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee Ji, and I think it's one of the most compact books uh, summarizing the um, so very layered life of uh, Vajpayee Ji. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See, I'm going to talk more about um, the work culture uh, between different parties, different political parties in, in, in the country. Now, for a BJP member, I know for a fact that um, in every national executive or in probably every party meeting, the one motto seems to be, you know, uh, to be which is which is uh, nation first, party next, self last. But yes, only in the last six years have we seen it it translating into real action the way it has never been before. Now let me take the last eight months. One of the reasons why India has been able to combat COVID-19 so well, given the size of India's population, which is 135 crore plus, given the fact that we have highest, uh, one of the highest densities in population, and given the fact that we are a democracy, we are not a territorial regime where figures can be concealed, hidden, where um, you know unparliamentary or undemocratic ways can be used to suppress uh, data. I think we have done a phenomenal job and one of the reasons is the hands-on, proactive, very involved leadership uh, which the country has. And if you compare it with the ignorant opposition, and I'm saying ignorant because Sanjay would also agree that the opposition needs to be a little more involved, a little more positive than just tweeting you know, out of the blue without really realizing the import of what they're saying so on the one hand you have the opposition leader asking when will every by when will every indian be vaccinated on, on the other hand you actually have a prime minister who's visiting the laboratories to take stock possibly of the scalability of production i'm sure he's not a scientist so he would not have much of a say on what goes in behind producing that vaccine but yes as someone who wants to take stock firsthand of the scalability of the vaccine production and how it can be uh you know made available to maximum number of people i think it's a first no world leader to my knowledge has traveled to the vaccine man manufacturing facilities so this difference which you see the 24 by 7 hands-on proactive preemptive <coughs> leadership preemptive because you know uh, problems are preempted rather than waiting for things to go out of hand this is a first which has not been seen in india before and that is what really separates uh, the ruling party of India with the opposition. And and uh, yes, I mean, uh, in the last six years, definitely, I would say there has been a change, a shift towards politics. Today, I think, um, yeah, if you, if you leave, uh, leave the negativity on Twitter aside, there is a larger chunk of the younger population wanting to be involved in data whether it is on the you know data and so far as the health sector is concerned infrastructure is concerned there is an awareness which was not there before and this awareness has been brought about because of the positive nature of leadership so yes politics at least an effort a sincere effort has been made to to veer politics or to to back towards serving the nation and which it had digressed from uh, thank you so much for pointing to the fact that there seems to be a difference in the work ethic between a, a, a politician who works for the nation and an opposition that is, um, well, tweets more than they think, but that is another sort of later conversation that one can even talk about how uh, when truly serving uh, the nation, you need a conversation between the, po the, the power, the incumbents and the opposition and how we see that. Um, Sanjay Jha, Mr. Jha, moving on to you, can we get your preliminary thoughts as well? Abir, I'll keep my views very brief. Uh, first and foremost, across political parties, the reason why cynicism with politicians is high is because all political parties and practically most political personalities too have flattered to deceive. Uh, let's be honest, the reason why you have a topic that seems to suggest that people in politics are there only for self-glorification or self-aggrandizement yeah. is a manifestation yeah. of the problem we have. I mean, we are discussing this problem because ultimately, like it or not, whether it's a BJP or the Congress or any regional formation, 
we are all yeah. guilty whether it's uh, sporadic uh, instances whether it's a systemic flaw or whether it's a party's culture we are all guilty of misleading the people of india at certain times uh, let me give you one example try and audit and i had recommended this and i'm going to probably push for it later the election commission should be empowered to do an audit of each and every party's manifesto before an election and what they mm-hmm. deliver afterwards you see what is shocking shocking for our democracy is the fact that political parties can make any wild you know you know absolutely shoot in the dark come up with preposterous promises the aam janta trusting or whatever credulous they fall for it a party gets voted to power what happens thereafter nobody knows nobody cares but i do believe that is the ultimate form of deception when in the when during the middle of a campaign you have made promises and you have you know kind of made lofty assurances that you deep in your heart know you're not going to fulfill to me that is the height of immorality and unethical public conduct but these are questions that are not being asked they are not being asked by civil society they are not being asked enough by the media i think mr nag has raised an issue on which i'm actually currently doing an article mr nag uh, okay. which talks about which talks about you know i'm actually taking an um, a comparison mr nag uh, between what an mp in uk handles for constituency vis-a-vis india and it's a ridiculous uh, to even expect an indian mp to go ahead and care for his people he won't have the time before majority of them sit in delhi which is why your topic today is relevant i want to make two short points to what i said earlier uh, as long as there is going to be a quid pro quo between a politician who's elected and who has to then satisfy his funders that he needs to kind of pay them back indian politics will continue to be toxic and corrupt let me give an example a lot of people ask me this question and in my forthcoming book called the great unraveling india after 2014 i answer that question a lot of people ask me why sanjay jha have you not fought a lok sabha election and i'll give you a very transparent answer on your on your show i don't do it because unfortunately i was brought up by a very principled man uh, who was an absolutely incorruptible person a professor of economics who told who, who who brought us up without a single source of unaccounted money coming into our home and i asked my people even in the congress party tell me let's be honest do we fight elections using our limits given by the election commission and i got an honest answer no to him sina waxed waxed eloquent on bjp's integrity but gopinath munde who was a former chief minister of maharashtra openly said i spent uh, 80 lakhs 8 crores or whatever i don't know what the number was and nobody batted an eyelid there is by the way in the 2019 and 2014 lok sabha elections the money spent was much more than in the us presidential elections and you are talking about this in a country where you have 22% people living below the poverty line and the per capita income being one of the lowest in the world so you know for people to say that politicians are into it for self aggrandizement or for glorification and fame is not off the mark but it is a shame if anybody is in politics today for anything other than public service because if that is the case then i think we are committing a, a an absolute brazen fraud on india's unsuspecting population which is a tragedy thank you so much i like this is something that i truly believe in that the only way that politics can function is we strengthen the civic muscle and we empower the average citizen to ask questions and and there are several questions that need to be asked in this day and age of our politicians and that's the only way as put by mr nag by mr sinha and you mr jha that the responsibility at the end of the day to make politicians work uh, falls on our mighty shoulders now when we think about this landscape when we think about um the even in the even the polarity or the polarization that is coming to our public sphere even to think about the conversation of whether politics works in self um, for self interest or for the nation there are some some very so i'll dovetail on what mr jha is saying and the question is that what motivates 
someone to work for the nation and what motivates someone to work in public interest when there are so many people who end up reposing faith in you there is a sense of entitlement that comes with the position of a politician there are people who come and 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 press your legs there are people who will come and treat you like a god so where does that interest come when our entire polity linked to the crisis of representation turns an average leader into a god can we expect that from them then so mr nag the crisis of representation means that more people vote for fewer people and when and when the power and lives of so many people is determined by a coterie they will have that power associated in terms of the the way they can impact people's lives so even say for example as mr sinha says that while this government is moving in a democratic form and they are there are certain decisions that they could take without consulting the opposition which was enforcing a lockdown and and in short notice and that impacted the lives of so many so what what exactly are you asking you know what should i answer the one thing which is happening right now is that a new parliament house is being built why is a new parliament house being built because we, our parliament house is very small and now they want to make a bigger parliament house people think that this is all with the idea a grandois plan but i'll say that they want to expand the parliament house because today's parliament house cannot even accommodate 500 members now you want if the population of the country is increasing and you want to give representation to everybody probably you should have a lok sabha with 15 1500 mps now that 1500 mps cannot be accommodated in the current parliament house therefore if somebody is saying that let's break the parliament house and make a new building so that new building will obviously accommodate more much more people so i don't know whether that is the idea bit in narendra modi's mind or not but the fact is that you require a bigger parliament house so that you can take into account the increase in population and with the increase in population we have a system where the number of mps also increase so that is one thing and uh, with that i have lost my thought what exactly you were saying <laughs> so the question again is that when fewer people vote when a larger sum of people vote for a few people and they win with such great margins and such great votes it will their, their decisions have a greater impact on a larger population so that gives them a sense of power automatically they do believe that they are you know the primary decision making group in a way where democracy eats the, uh, is eaten away so i do think that the number of mps should be increased and when the number of mps increase you will require a bigger parliament house so that you will have a new and new delhi so which is happening now so there is nothing wrong in that now each mp today represent some 20 lakh voters etc we must have a system where they represent far little, little number of people just as i said in new delhi constituency in 1971 there were 1 lakh voters today there are more than 25 lakh voters so you must first first thing number of seats in lok sabha should be increased number two the constituency should be created that they are smaller and after that you can go to other things the fundamental thing is that you have to increase the number of people mps so that their representation increases today we don't know we, we don't have the representation that's why if there are only few seats and there are too many fellows then only the rich guy can win so that is But why what does that do much money but what does that do to the psyche of a politician as well what does that do to someone who has such sort of unmitigated power over other people and the ability to get work done if you change the system then slowly slowly he will go out of power because you will not vote for him necessarily i change the system you will have more mps i won't have an mp which rules over the life of so many people so therefore the number of constituency should be increased and when the number of constituencies are increased there will be more mps and when there are more mps if the power of each over anybody is much lesser so that is the fundamental thing i am not talking from the question of their psyche as the way you are answering the question is what do you do we have more mps when you have more mps they represent a smaller number of people so i assume that if they represent a smaller number of people their integrity is higher that is exactly what i am trying to say and, and the second thing that you have talked about Uh, even how our system of voting the first past the post also creates certain amount of problems so would you like to highlight that here there are many uh, systems in this world and uh, the most used form is the pr form that is proportional representation and proportional representation has also many 
used to it. But most countries use the first part of this system, first path the post. And let us use the first path the post and then see how the system works. Because otherwise it becomes very complicating. The, in the system is of single transferable votes, which is used in Australia and New Zealand is supposed to be the most appropriate one. But that will be very confusing for the voters. So let's not go to get into a system which is most and most confusing for the voter and is difficult for a person like me to explain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Sinha, um, in, in our conversation before, you had mentioned that what drives the, the, the publicness of a politician and what separates their sort of self-interest is the difference between meritocracy and nepotism. But when we do have that conversation on nepotism and meritocracy, what does it mean? And we have also dovetailed to this is that we need to understand how we can even say, discuss and move nep uh, remove nepotism from the uh, politics of India in a complete way. Or do you see that we do need to navigate nepotism and also bring in meritocracy? <coughs> and does that sort of define the way we look at self-interest in politics? You can't, uh, if you are in politics or if you are an actor, whatever if you are a cricketer you can't prevent your next generation or your descendants to, to from from uh, imbibing that profession or from uh, embracing that profession but the only difference between a, an out and out nepotistic party and a party where your you know family members can exist but will not enjoy any privilege i think there needs to be a distinction between that so yes today now that you know bjp in its present form from 1980 is 40 years old Yes, surely the, the second generation of, uh, of uh, you know, the uh, sec second generation leaders from families which or, or from, you know, sec uh, people from families of those who, who were the initial leaders in 80s and 90s. are Yes, they are in politics, but they, they don't enjoy undue benefits purely because uh, their fathers or their mothers enjoyed that position. I think that distinction is important. Secondly, you were talking about entitlement coming from people supporting you. I think entitlement coming from people supporting you is not so much validated or worrisome as the fact as entitlement from usurped power. For example, I have never seen a more perverse sense of entitlement in a government than the present government in, in Maharashtra, where one of the descendants of a political clan the only reason why he usurped power was maine apne pitaji ko vaada kiya tha ki ek din shiv sena ka mukhyamantri banega so that becomes the reason for you to subvert mandate and join hands with people whom you have been critical of and you know said the worst things about all your life and today if you look at it the way social media warriors of uh, or those critical of the government are being locked behind bars i think that is what is the most perverse sense of entitlement and no it does not emanate from from people supporting you it emanates from a sense of insecurity where you know that your party is virtually non-existent and on the wane <coughs> mr jha uh, have we lost to him no uh, mr jha would you like to add two bits or uh, your your point of view on the question of nepotism and meritocracy and how it has panned out in indian politics and whether that eats away at the conversation of self interest or public service no, I think uh, performance or, you know, being part of a caucus or being a sycophant, this is a, a political culture across parties. No party can claim to be holier than thou. Uh, you know, even Tuhin's party is very critical of whether we have organizational elections. But you look at their own party and, you know, presidents are virtually appoint appointed. There's no real election happening. And, uh, you know, each and every party is basically terribly opportunistic. This is a fact. Ideology is only a namesake, uh, cosmetic statement which is made. I mean, why would the BJP be in bed with the PDP in Jammu and Kashmir and then pull it off and now call them anti-national? I mean, you know, it, it's rather absurd. And you're looking at India's most security sensitive state. So let, let, let's come down to the real fundamental point of your debate. See, in my opinion, there are two things that define why the people of India, why your viewers today treat politicians with skepticism, with cynicism and distrust. One is, as we said earlier, the sheer abuse of money. You know, the extravagant, uh, ostentatious, 
you know, the way money is basically put out there in the public domain, you will remember that during the time of the demonetization, there were marriages happening with crores being spent and there was nobody asking questions. So we have become, as a society, let's be honest, we have become so calcified or ossified that we now feel that politicians to aise hi hai yaar. You know, whether you select a politician for party X, Y, or Z, they are all corrupt, they are all crooks, they are all criminals. Now, while talking criminals, even in you know the current government, if you look at the 2014 cabinet, I haven't really reviewed the 19 cabinet, you had the ADR saying that 32% of the people in the cabinet were criminals. Today, and Mr. Nag will probably agree with me, that the number of crorepati politicians in India is like almost a given. And once upon a time, you had leaders like Lal Bahadur Shastri who were taking bank loans to buy an ambassador car. So, you know, there has been a complete, what I call is a change in the very, shall we say, core of Indian politics. That, you know, it's good to have educated people there. No, nobody's going to deny it. But at the end of the day, we have criminals in politics and they are, by the way, far overtaking the system. You have people with unlimited access to commerce, most of it unaccounted cash. And, you know, the third point, which is lying in the Supreme Court for a long time, and in my opinion, is an hypothesis of what is wrong with Indian politics. And it will continue to be like this for years on end. Mr. Nag, Tuhin, Ahuja, Mr. Kapoor, Sanjay will keep talking. It will never change until you reform campaign finance, until you reform electoral, electoral reforms. You see, the simple point is parties can spend what they want, no questions are asked. There is no, no way by which you can contain uh, any degree of expenditures being made. And look at what I call, and Tuhin probably will address it, I hope. Uh, look at electoral bonds. Mm -hmm. Electoral bonds by which today a corporate can donate money to a political party. The donor's name remains anonymous. It doesn't even come in the annual reports. Why is the donor and the donee so secretive about the source of funding? So if I'm a political party and Tuhin Sina funds me an X amount, who knows how many public contracts am I handing him back? And therefore, corruption in our system is never going to be obliterated until we bite the bullet. So let me nail it down to one point. If you don't reform campaign finance, Indian politics will have the worst kind of people in it. It will have criminals and crooks from all political parties. And only thing, one day he will gloat that I got 30% corrupt and I say I got 22% corrupt. And one day he will say that you are more and I'm less. That's about it but nothing is fundamentally going to change. Thank you so much. So there are three basic points that, uh, according to me, that Mr. Jha raises, and uh, Mr. Nak, can you, if you would like to respond to them or even build them up and build on them. One is that there is a certain, there is a move away from ideology and, and a certain public culture that the politician represented, a certain higher moral value and a certain type of politician that existed, which is sort of being eroded at, which is being replaced by a self-interest driven, more thuggish, more criminal politician. The second one is the opaqueness of our system, not only in terms of the money that is funding political parties, but also in the way we're able to make people understand. Where is what and how do you now imagine the role of the media confronted by a more opaque system, confronted by a change in the quality and pu the publicness of leaders? Where does the, the how can the media push a uh, democracy to function in the way that you want it to function if you want the, if you want the media to push any democracy or anything else then you have to have a media but the media is getting destroyed now so let's not talk about the media what i'll tell you is how corruption introduced into indian politics corruption became big time in around 91 92 when we introduced the system of liberalization before that businessmen used to pay money to politicians who used to do their job with liberalization, business became very big and the businessman thought and the contractor thought, why should I pay money to anybody to do my work? I myself enter politics. So after 91, 92, there's a lot more introduction of uh, corporate culture into uh, politics. And if you see, us in, when I came to Andhra Pradesh, when you see the um, representation of MPs in Andhra Pradesh, you'll be shocked. <coughs> of the MPs were 
contractors themselves. And in Andhra Pradesh, of course, now the state is broken. In Andhra Pradesh, the contractors were the cost of politics was much higher. They used to, and in fact, I know that this an MP to be elected would spend something like sixty crores. Where does he get sixty crores? It was not too difficult for them because they are all road contractors, other contractors, etc. So when they become an MP, they go to Delhi. If they are in the if they are in the winning party, then they get contracts. So a lot of contractors were in Andhra Pradesh and entered politics. After some time, they were taking projects in Himachal Pradesh, Sikkim, X, Y, Z, and their businesses were also expanding. So this is the closest link between politics and business that I've seen, and I think it is so damn. And I'm sure the same thing happens in all other states, but in the last few years I've been in this state, so I know the examples here. So today, today politics is the handmaiden of business. So there are no professional politicians anymore. We are talking, we are talking, who was somebody, uh, Ms. Sanjay Jha was talking about Lal Bahadur Shasti. Lal Bahadur Jha was a professional politician. But today we have got professional businessmen acting as politicians. So when they are professional businessmen, they will look. In, they when they become an MP, they will see how much money I can make from this contract, that contract. So that is how politics has changed. Of course, our friends who in cinema say no, no, there is some ideology also RSS people, etc., etc. I agree with him. But even in all parties today, they are more into money culture. And I'm sorry to say, I'll say so openly. I am sure this is terrible for the country, but this is exactly what is happening. That's how you'll find all sorts of contractors becoming. In the good old days, we used to talk about educated politicians. But getting education is not difficult anymore. In fact, you know, the more money you are, your education will be better. You will have a foreign degree you from US, etc. So the question is how to take away money from the system. For that, other things have to be done. So, and I think the first thing you should be done is to number increase the number of seats. Uh, Mr. Sinha, I think there are a few questions that um, that have emerged in this in this conversation. One is of the opaqueness of campaign funding. The second is the 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 certain change in the quality of politician that has emerged. The and 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 also a certain collapse of civic sense in terms of the ability of civil society to be able to hold politicians accountable and get them to do their work. So, can you please? Uh, tell us what you think of these and whether what would you like to talk about in response? Well, you know, even in the prevailing circumstances, we managed to send a Pratap Sarangi to Parliament, a guy who has travelled by cycle all his life and barely has uh, one or two lakh worth of assets with him. I think that is the achievement of the system. We need more Pratap Sarangis, and for that, like Kinchuti mentioned, I think if the number of constituencies, it's a matter of time. Uh, uh, delimitation uh, exercise uh, will over in a couple of years, I suppose, and the constituencies will be expanded. Uh, and, and and I guess, you know, people from professional backgrounds, not necessarily businessmen, but, uh, you know, educated people coming into politics will make the difference. Unfortunately, what I have experienced over the years is that while social engineering may have changed in so far as the voters are concerned, today, you know, the voting patterns uh, which were existed 30 years ago have probably changed. So Yadav or uh, Dalit may not vote the way he would have voted. Unfortunately, the political parties at the time of distribution of the tickets somehow, you know, still stick to the caste formula many a times. I think if that changes in totality, that would make a real difference because eventually when you have to distribute 150 assembly tickets or when you have to distribute 50 uh, Lok Sabha tickets in a in a particular state, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure Sanjay would also agree with this, but caste calculations do become a very important factor and that in a way does away with the deservingness or the, or the, or the merit which otherwise should be the sole criteria in the distribution of the tickets. <coughs> Um, but, uh, and just pressing you on the opaqueness of the of the entire electoral system, and what as Mr. Jha and Nag have pointed to, that perhaps 
increasing the number of candidates is important but even fixing or even bringing in certain amount of clarity into the system is also of urgent import and if you could comment on that the election commission needs to you know just implement uh, rules and regulation for strictly because all of these uh, limitations in the expenditure on spending exists on paper and yes the election commission has been pretty alert but i guess still you know the malpractices uh, exist and they've not been completely eradicated so i can just hope that the election commission uh, acts with even greater stringency in in arresting the malpractices uh, there was a time when, in fact, L.K. Advani ji was the most vocal in, in rooting for public funding of elections. Unfortunately, that's an idea which, uh, which died out, which has died out in the last 10 years. But I guess limited public funding of election would be another way to actually bring in professionals into the system, educated professionals who don't necessarily, uh, you know, professional <clears throat> politicians many a times have their own uh, disadvantages. I agree, you know. People entering politics, businessmen entering politics for pure mercenary interests is wrong. But at the same time, compared to professional politicians, if uh, subject matter experts or you know experts from different fields actually enter politics, they make a big difference. But the larger question is, I have realized, uh, I think the political parties are not prepared for it. It'll, it'll just be some more time, some more years before they warm up to the idea of professionals actually established professionals or achievers moving into the party and contributing their bit. I guess it's a matter of time. It will take some time. Uh, Mr. Jha, uh, Mr. Jha's book is coming out in December. Uh, and talking about the unraveling, do you think a strengthening of the civic muscle uh, by looking at greater participation amongst the youth, amongst civil society organizations who have faced the brunt uh, of, of our current scenario, do you think that we, uh, the, the unraveling of, say, even the suspicion of politicians can be stemmed by strengthening the civic muscle and you would like sort of address it in your book? Well, Abir, I mean, you have preempted me here. Uh, my book, The Great uh, Unraveling India After 2014, which, by the way, launches on December 21, and uh, I should be having the links for the advanced booking out by next week. Uh, the publishers are Westland. Uh, I want to make a point that in the book, I have dedicated a whole chapter to what I call is the institutional emasculation in India. And, you know, this is not about Tuhin's party or my party. I believe for governance, for society, for a nation, and for democracy to flourish, for a constitutional system to be strong, you need very strong institutions, whether it is administration, whether it's governance, whether it's investigation, prosecution, judiciary, election, you name it. The Reserve Bank of India, media, broadcast, Doordarshan, you need institutions that cannot be, shall we say, bespoke or tailored to suit one political party. So BJP is in power. It puts, you know, the saffron friendly people in, in those positions of bureaucratic influence. When the Congress comes in, it puts the, the liberals in, in, in various institutions. You know, you want dispassionate, impartial governance. You see, the people of India, no matter how hard different parties try, by and large remain a liberal, secular, maybe they're even conservative. But I wouldn't call that the India is a hardline, you know, religious country or India is necessarily just, I mean, the BJP, yes, has been very anti-minority in a great number of ways. But I don't think India is like that. I mean, you know, these are voting patterns that will change. I'm sure the next election could throw a, a humongous surprise. So I believe the biggest worry we should have in our country today is that people are losing faith in institutions. I'll give you an example. And this is very common to two big democracies, America and India. In America, you have a sitting president who says, I don't believe in my own election officials, who doesn't believe in American democracy. An American president who is actually telling the courts that you delegitimize the votes of the same American public whom you say you're the president of. In India, after every election, there is a criticism of the EVM. The hard elections got over, and immediately there was a criticism of the EVM and the election officials. And you know why people buy into it? Because people don't have faith anymore. 
the whole erosion of trust in india's public institutions is one of the biggest crises that we face today and both the congress and the bjp as two national parties have a massive responsibility to ensure that we are not infiltrating institutions with ideologically friendly people who are then taking institutions into a certain trajectory that can only be deleterious for india's health now I'll give you one example there are so many questions being raised today very openly against india's supreme court i mean the supreme court is a supreme court it passes judgments we have a right to agree to disagree but today the very fact that people believe that even a supreme court judgment does have a certain complexion i mean this is the public perception this is i'm not saying it i'm this is the general public perception you can see it on twitter people are anxious today to begin to trust anybody other than a political party so today 37% of indians who voted for the means party will believe the bjp the balance 63 people 63% whoever they have voted for will not believe the bjp i think this is all right you can believe or not trust a political party but if you today don't trust for example bureaucracy or the police or the judiciary or or the media or the election commission or the national uh, uh, investigation authority or you don't trust cbi or the enforcement directorate or the income tax then we have a massive problem of i think unspeakable magnitude and this is something that all of us whether we are politicians or journalists we need to address that uh bringing the conversation uh, so this is the last sort of things that uh the final question that i have for all of you and i'll start with mr nag is that what is sort of emerging very quickly in this conversation is that and this was a conversation that you and i had at the sidelines as well that democracy is seemingly failing there is a certain short termism that is inbuilt into the way the five year electoral cycle functions which forces a certain push and an alteration of um, you flood the political system with your people you try to stay in power at whatever cost so is there a way that democracy in itself can be refixed and here i'm not talking about representation i am talking about an institutional correctness certain institutional mechanism and this is something that we've and this is uh, what we've always found that certain countries including israel and saudi arabia are moving to institute something called the ministry of the future the ministry of the future guarantees and protects a certain idea and the citizenship of <coughs> india from sort of impromptu or or short term laws so as a closing remark my three questions to you is one that do you think democracy is what is got us here and is there a way that india can reform its democracy not only limited to representation that can make and push political parties to work beyond themselves and in the interest of a nation which is driven by short terms before that we have to talk about representation again we have not talked about caste how the when india became began its journey after freedom you wanted to remove caste but unfortunately caste groups have strengthened and why because the elections are all held in a basis where caste have increased so today when a fellow gets become some minister you say is sc is obc is st or is a patel or is a reddy why do we talk in those terms but the system has given rise to such thinking so when you change the system it is nothing to do with democracy now even if you have a democratic country with all democracy but you find you find that certain parties represent certain castes we know it so i talk only about andhra pradesh because i am staying here in andhra pradesh we know that the congress party represents only the reddies we had the telugu desam party which was in power they represent only the kammas we just want and then there are some parties represent the kapus i was also earlier in gujarat In Gujarat, also the BJP became strong when the strongest caste, the Patels, who were in the Congress, left the Congress party and joined the BJP. So Indian politics is, in a way, matter of caste. So can you change the caste system? Now the caste system has become very strong because when on political basis, you get the way you get elected, you give rise to certain caste. So democracy ki baat dusri hai. Now what was your second question? You made. You were asking something else, Nabil. Ha. Huh. So my question is that, and I will sort of link it to yours, which is that uh, you are pointing to. Uh, so 
when we're confronted with short termism and short five year cycles <coughs> in terms of political parties and the need to stay in power caste acts as a definite sort of way that comes into um the ability to plan or build institutions that guarantee and safeguard everyone because self interest drives it so how do you see our democracy moving forward where these institutions do not fall these institutions stay strong where party politics does not trump progress or development or vikas the, the question is the problem is that progressive what is progressive development is a matter of view points you will think what is progressive i think it is not it is regressive so there is no national consensus on that na no? yeah. instead of that let us think in terms of a system which operates in a such a way that it benefits everybody else so can i say that with the indian constitution has been on for so many years can we think of a new system of politics can we think of a new system of elections let us think of it maybe some answers will come maybe some people will not like it sanjay jai is smiling i think he doesn't like what i say but that's okay i, I agree with you i agree so with let, you <laughs> so let's have a new system now now the indian constitution first elections were held in 1951 we there we are now in 2020 it is finishing so now we are already 70 years so we should think in terms of amending the system irrespective of who is in power and who is not a power to develop a system which will benefit the most of the people can we think of it i think that is the first fundamental thing and this democracy business is all nonsense i think sorry to say so because when you don't have democracy in your own house why should you talk about democracy in the country <laughs> absolutely ha ah, you have you say women representation and then you have the men behind them तो पहले डेमोक्रेसी लाना तो अपने घर में तो लाओ घर में ही नहीं है तो क्या सोसाइटी में तो डेमोक्रेसी नहीं है व्हाई टॉक अबाउट डेमोक्रेसी एट द नेशनल लेवल आई थिंक दैट्स द प्रॉब्लम इन इंडिया वी वेंट विद वेस्टर्न कांसेप्ट्स एंड ट्राई टू इंट्रोड्यूस इन इंडिया मच बिफोर देयर टाइम एंड देयरफॉर वी लैंडेड अप इन ट्रबल सो नाउ वी शुड रीथिंक आवर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इन व्यू ऑफ द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द पीपल एंड व्हाट पीपल थिंक एंड नॉट नेसेसरीली ऑन वेस्टर्न टर्मिनोलॉजी ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी एटसेट्रा एटसेट्रा दैट्स व्हाई आई वांट टू से I I don't think I need to sort of summarize what Mr. Nagar said to him. Uh, please feel free to build upon it, respond to it. No, I am um, anyway very dismissive of the democracy is in danger or the constitution is in danger club. Yeah. So I think our, our democracy is very robust. It's doing exceptionally well. But yes, we do need a ministry for you talked about uh, ministry for future. I feel we need you know this is this is something which has been on my mind. We need a ministry for innovation. because whether it is electoral reforms whether it is uh, you know the health sector the education sector i think unless there are, there are radical reforms unless we are ready to tweak things around 180 degrees or at least be prepared for a discussion to tweak them 180 degrees at any point of time i don't think the country would be you know the the vishwa guru the absolute vishwa guru which we which we envision or we imagine it to be in the coming years a certain bipartisanism in terms of the journey of india is also necessary when a different set of voices do come and plan the ministry of the future or the ministry of innovation uh which mr jha final comments on whether this is a professional ministry whether career politicians have a place in it and <laughs> whether it can eventually guide us in a direction where civic muscle and civic power can sort of be asserted sir uh abir respectfully i will uh, not agree with uh, mr nag that democracy is some kind of an esoteric abstraction uh, that is just to be treated as an western import i don't think so i think i think democracy is a fundamental bloodline of this country i mean like it or not today we are not pakistan or we haven't had like a look at our neighboring countries since independence every country has gone through some serious overthrow of elected governments whether it is pakistan uh, nepal you know myanmar uh, bangladesh and and uh, you know sri lanka and the maldives india has had its its bad moments the emergency was a terrible aberration that happened when we were in government but you know i think end of day let's recognize this is a diverse country and every voice in this country must have a freedom to express itself you know let us not be casual about the fact that today if there are questions being raised about media freedom i think mr nag himself said don't talk about media media is destroyed isn't that a source of worry because as a common person abir and apurva for instance 
what is her source of transparent information? She will not have access to Tuhin and me directly, probably. But the only way she gets to know is what the Times of India or the Indian Express or an NDTV or the Times now or Danit Jagran says. So if we don't have a transparent media, it's a common person of India who actually ends up suffering because you get to see a journalist propaganda. So today, I think the biggest threat to us is the fact that the institutions of democracy have itself become very fragile. And like it or not, it is a matter of great concern to me that journalists have been targeted, the journalists have been transferred, media houses are targeted. I don't care whether they're right-leaning or left-leaning. All right, That I'm not, not bothered about. But I do believe that the media has to look within and correct itself is also part of the change that is required. But you need democracy because if you don't have democracy, I'll tell you who's the biggest loser. The biggest loser is the Dalit. The biggest loser is the scheduled tribe. The biggest loser is the, shed, is, the, is, the, is the Adivasi. The biggest loser are the Muslims. The biggest loser are the women. Because in India, if you can fight for the marginalized sections, you need a robust democracy. And you cannot do that by just paying lip service to it. Therefore, I want to end by saying that civil society's role is not just to turn out in big numbers and vote in an election and choose their candidates. You can choose Tuhin, you can choose Sanjay. But more important, if you choose Tuhin, make sure that you're watching over him. Be alert. Don't let him get away by bulldozing your system. If you elect me, watch what I do. Because as a lot of people are saying, we had an official emergency for 21 months. But there are a lot of people are also saying that you have had an unofficial emergency in India for the last over 60 months as well. So these are matters of grave concern. And, and the Washington Post has a great line. Democracy dies in darkness. But I do believe it needs to change. Democracy even dies in daylight. Thank you so much. And as uh, just wrapping up the conversation um, and, and, and giving a quote which I truly fancy and believe in, is that uh, at the at at the uh, when in 2000 Amartya Sen was asked what do you think what he thought was the biggest innovation of the uh, 20th century and he said it was democracy and then in 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 an article he wrote that democracy is a habit you have to practice it every day and I think what will ensure politics working in favor and in in for the nation is that if we as citizens we as media we as politicians <clears throat> understand that democracy habit is a habit and it is our responsibility to do it very much like we're fighting the coronavirus and washing our hands and wearing masks democracy in itself is also a habit of asking questions and as, uh, holding other people accountable uh thank you uh, Mr. Nag, thank you, Mr. Sinha, thank you, Mr. Jha. I hope uh, you guys found this conversation great. I had a great time, we did. and we did. to hear it and hearing such a wide, wide um, uh, spectrum of opinions and thoughts. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, you Orange City Literature Festival, for having us. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Tohen, Mr. Nag, Abir, Purva. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, you, Purva. Thank you so much, sir. On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. I would like to thank our supporting publisher, Rupa Publication India, for their contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Twenty years of existence, two universities, 23 educational institutes, offering 137 courses, Rai Sony Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.